it's happy. All right, um, so y'all are here for GRPC and introduction. Um, I'm Eric Anderson, and uh, Jan Colhey is here too, but he's, uh, he's gonna reduce a little bit of how much he's talking. So he'll be around for Q&A, uh, and he might jump in if he really doesn't like something I say or something like that, but. Um, so a uh, quick audience poll. Um, raise your hand if you have some idea of what GRPC is. All right, uh, raise your hand if you're planning to use GRPC. Uh, how about if you are using gRPC? Okay, and then how many of y'all want to develop, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, be a, a contributor to gRPC? Please, yeah, yes, 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 we, we were there. Um, so uh, there are some other talks um, during the day. Uh, this sli these slides are on uh, the schedule, so you can go ahead and download them. I'm not gonna spend too much time on the slide, but there are some talks during the day, uh, today, like um, there's another one I'll be doing uh, later today. Um, so gRPC stands for gRPC Remote Procedure Calls. Um, we've got the nice recursive acronym going there. Um, we have fun with the G and that's like our code name uh, for various releases and stuff. It's a high performance, standards based, uh, open source, general purpose, uh, feature rich RPC framework, all those things. Um, we are part of CNCF um, as an incubating project um, and it's pretty nice for making uh, native cloud apps, uh, and um, it's it's come came out of the the it's the next generation of what we had as Stubby inside of gRPC uh, sorry inside of Google, uh, which Stubby had proven itself uh, very very strongly as being able to scale and uh, basically satisfy all of our needs uh, at Google. Um, so it's uh, still actively developed. Um, there's lots of PR still coming in. Uh, it is production ready. Please go and use it. There should be no risk there. And uh, we're currently at version 1.25. We've got a six uh, week release cadence. So the gRPC itself can work with things other than protocol buffers, um, but I'm gonna emphasize protocol buffers just because that's what uh, is typically used and that's sort of the, the normal uh, getting started process and stuff. Uh, and the ecosystem overall typically uses protocol buffers. Um, so protocol buffers, uh, the general process is you make a dot proto file, which has the IDL, which is, that's the interface uh, definition language. It sort of defines the contract between a client and a server. And that will have both uh, the messages that you all are gonna send back and forth, but also the services and RPCs that'll be within. Uh, using that proto file, there are code generators uh, for basically all your favorite languages uh, that pr produce a nice idiomatic stub uh, and um, API in order to access it and implement those, uh, those services and use those messages. Um, and so, for example, it'll produce a, uh, a, a server stub that you'll extend and then implement your own business logic. And then on client side, it'll implement a, a client stub where you just call a particular method after connecting. Um, so, uh, because some, uh, many of y'all may not be, uh, granted there were lots of hands of people familiar with gRPC, or, uh, so a lot of people probably know gRPC, or protocol buffers, but uh, it's a binary data representation. Uh, it's heavily intended to be, uh, or one of its uh, uh, strong um, features is the backward compatibility story. You can add to it, um, and it's, over time you can add more and more things, and it's gonna be pretty compact on the wire as you do so. Uh, and this uh, has had code generators for many languages for quite a while, but there's now a lot more, um, and it is nicely strongly typed for all those people that like that, uh, as opposed to just some maps and some lists and hope you know what's inside of there. Um, it's not required uh, for gRPC, as I said, um, but it's very, very handy. So there, there's sort of a, a nice mixing of the, the, the two projects. <coughs> So we'll sort of go through an example. Uh, this is the route guide example, which is sort of the second uh, example in, if you're looking at a repo that has the hello world and things like that. Um, and so there's a couple different things. It's a little small over there on the right, but um, basically we're gonna need to define some messages. Um, this is talking about like a geographical route where you're moving from point A to point B. Um, so we'll need to talk about like points on a globe. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, features that are something 
of interest at a certain point. Uh, and then there's also notes that people can uh, exchange back and forth. Um, and then there's also going to be uh, two methods that we're going to be talking about here, which is uh, a Git feature saying, hey, I'm at this place. What's at this place? Uh, and uh, the route chat where people can sort of send notes back and forth uh, if you're geographically located near each other. Um, and so the first thing you, you will do is you go ahead and define, in, you start with your proto, as I said, and you go ahead and define the messages you're working with. So here we've got a, uh, a point, and it's got a latitude and a longitude. Um, and these messages are basically like structures, uh, very similar to that. Um, and then we've got a feature, which has inside of it a nested uh, point. Um, the nested point has a, um, uh, is, is, is sort of acts like a pointer where you can know whether or not it's set. So it's, uh, and then we've got this route note, which also contains a point, and it has some, some sort of arbitrary message that one user is wanting to send another. Um, so now we're finally getting into gRPC. So we've got some messages which we're wanting to communicate uh, between a client and a server, and uh, we're going to define some services down here at the bottom. Uh, so every um, uh, a service is just a collection of uh, RPC methods or RPC uh, functions. Um, they are a service itself is basically just a namespace uh, where all these sorts of things go within. Um, and within this, we went ahead and defined two RPCs. Um, RPCs uh, in gRPC and in Protobuf uh, have one, exactly one request and exactly one response. Uh, if you need multiple arguments or things like that, you just put those inside of a message. Um, and that allows you to add things in the future. It, it's not fun if you only have two arguments, you need to add a third, and you can't because that would break all of your existing um, uh, clients. But then there's something a little bit interesting over here. Um, gRPC does not just do this normal request response uh, that's typical for RPCs. It also supports streaming. And streaming is a series of ordered um, uh, messages, one after the other. And the client can do streaming, the server can do streaming, they can both do streaming. And so that's where we get client streaming, server streaming, and BiDi. Um, and BiDi streaming is, is the most advanced. Um, it basically lets you do whatever the heck you want at that point. It's your own sort of um, TCP, but based on messages, and you get some levels of routing and some other things, um, nicety. Uh, Unary RPC is by far the most common. Uh, that uh, we would hope that that's most cases. Um, because it's much simpler, much faster to, to get your head around, uh, and it doesn't require as much uh, telling people how to use it. But um, whenever there's, uh, so let's say you want to do a watch service where you were going to do notifications or something like that, which we have in this route chat, uh, we can go ahead and do streaming. Uh, and so this streaming allows someone, um, it, it's it, this little chat, it can, they can send a new message whenever they want. It's just an open uh, stream. So the, it's the SpyDi streaming here. Um, and they can uh, send a message whenever they want. And then e whenever something happens, they can receive a message whenever they want. And so it's just an open channel that can um, do whatever they need at that moment. There's no waiting for uh, another request to come in or needing to, to create new RPCs whenever the old ones uh, finish for each and every single message. Um, so we defined the proto. Um, it happens that that by itself does not do anything. Uh, like we actually need code apparently to implement the clients and servers. Uh, this is still the world we live in where we actually have to uh, be developers. And so um, the code generators will take that proto and then give you something that's, that's good, nice, and usable. Um, so the messages get turned into idiomatic objects for the various languages. Um, and then the, uh, the service gets sent generated into like an abstract class, if that's the sort of language paradigm. And then you get a, 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 a client, sort of, we call them client stubs. You get a client to be able to, be able to send those messages and receive the messages. Um, and so, for example, here's a, a, what it, a rough sort of view of what it would look like in C++. Again, these slides are on the schedule. Um, so the, the, the very top is the, the stub that the client would end up using. Um, and it looks mostly like a normal feature, uh, function call, except you're going to have this, this larger uh, request and larger response that you're going to be putting in there. Um, and then there's a way to go ahead and create a new stub uh, to some destination. 
And then at the bottom here is uh, the service server side of this stub. It's just got two methods here that you just override and implement yourself. Uh, and it receives the request and it can uh, respond with the response. And those are just uh, data that you're just gonna fill up and return whenever you're done. Uh, and yes, so it was down here at the bottom. And then up at the top was that uh, the client, what the client would use. And so uh, we, we talked about there's quite a few features. Um, just RPC by itself, it's been around for quite a while. Uh, in some ways, um, not too interesting because we've had it for so long. Um, but uh, gRPC is in basically all the languages that people tend to care about. Um, yes, it, there's some ellipses down here at the bottom as well. Um, if you're wanting a language and it's reasonably mainstream, it, it's probably in this list. Um, and so that's not a problem for you. You can use a gRPC service wherever, whatever uh, the clients and servers are. If you, if uh, the clients and servers are, are mixed and matched which languages, uh, if you've got a very uh, heterogeneous uh, set of, of clients, you can make all that happen. Also, uh, it's working pretty well for uh, the various platforms. If you're on mobile, if you are on Windows, or if you're on Linux, uh, if you're on IoT, on some, uh, some ARM device, um, all of those will work well with gRPC. The, um, the strict service contracts is talking about the proto, um, the, the, sorry, the dot proto, which is that IDL. And the IDL is very, very uh, important and useful. Um, since that is the entire definition of what your service is and what it does. And um, so th this, uh, I cannot sort of understate the, or I cannot overstate truly, uh, how important this is for um, bringing some sort of semblance to the wild world that is uh, APIs. Um, but it provide, you can do uh, semantic versioning with it uh, because there's a package system. Um, you can uh, do things that are like stateless RESTful APIs. So, um, there's some options that you can annotate on RPCs and there's some translators uh, in the ecosystem which will give an, a gRPC um, service generate REST uh, service. And so that's a very nice thing for whenever some people aren't. Uh, wanting to do um, gRPC on the client side, or uh, you're gonna go to an ecosystem that would prefer really REST. Um, and some of the CRUD stuff here is, is, is related to the REST. Uh, so gRPC is a binary protocol. Protobuf was a binary protocol. Um, gRPC relies heavily on HTTP2. Um, it, that allows us to uh, to multiplex multiple RPCs all on one connection, which um, as TLS is more and more important, uh, that means just creating more connections you know, willy-nilly uh, is more expensive. And so that means uh, you can do more RPCs with, with fewer resources. Um, but there's also some other benefits we get like header compression and things like that, which um, mean that we can actually transmit RPCs more efficiently. Um, and so we, we have optimized the, the, um, the, the libraries. Um, they are much faster than most people tend to need them, um, which is a pretty good place to be. Uh, the, the, so Stubby at uh, Google was very important because it was a central place where all the things could go at Google. Um, and gRPC, the, we needed this sort of a place, with, like we knew that gRPC was gonna be important to be able to inject and make it do the things you wanted it to do. So there's plenty of extension points where you can do um, your own integrations or there's plenty of integrations in the community uh, for the various services, whether that's going to be uh, some sort of service discovery in order to find your, uh, your um, servers and do load balancing, whether that's stats and tracing or security um, or just doing something that's very, very application specific, that is just, you know, you made that, you know, two years ago and y'all are still using it sort of idea. Um, also, because it's on top of HTTP2, it's gonna work with um, proxies. The majority of, uh, there's plenty of HTTP2 proxies out there um, and many of them are heavily used. Um, so the generated code um, does allow us to provide very nice uh, APIs that are easy to use. Um, also, the, the installation story is, uh, is very nice. Um, there are some binary components in many of the languages, which um, 
can, uh, can slow down uh, installation, but we've got binaries produced, which makes it very easy to just sort of use the normal packaging tools to install things. Um, and then there's also things like cancellation propagation, uh, which uh, as you've got a big network of RPCs can help propagate information from one, uh, from one node to another to reduce, um, uh, to reduce your load or to, to give up once something, uh, once the client no longer cares or to give you an idea of how much time you have to do an operation. You're like, ah, two microseconds isn't enough time for me to do this RPC. Uh, yeah, maybe that's not gonna work out too well. Um, so you're able to know that before you get started. I also talked already um, some about the streaming. Uh, the streaming is an escape hatch in some ways. Um, it's, again, something that the majority of RPCs don't need or shouldn't use. But in a given application, it's likely that you're going to need it at some point. Like, you know, there's that one thing that you needed to do. And so you don't have to ditch everything and then go find another uh, service, another way to communicate or, you know, do something on top of TCP yourself or anything like that, uh, you can end up just continuing to use gRPC and you are able to, to use the streaming. Streaming is very nice for the, the, the notification systems and things like that, um, but with the BiDi, you can basically do whatever you need. Um, the, the client streaming and server streaming are, uh, I guess, especially server streaming. Um, that's a thing that lots of people like because of like the notifications that the server can just push. Uh, sometimes the client streaming, you can do the same thing if you've got a sort of reversed uh, role between the client and the server. Um, uh, and those, those aren't really all that complicated. The, the BiDi streaming is where you get into the most of the complexity. Uh, and that BiDi streaming is full duplex, and so you can have basically whatever protocol you want. There's not any of this, uh, you have to send all of the requests before you receive all the responses. Uh, gRPC is, is based on HTTP2, I mentioned that, um, and that is uh, an RFC, it's a nice standard. Um, we are developed, uh, gRPC is developed on GitHub, and we've been in CNCF for two, two and a half years. Um, there is a, an RFC-like process for design changes, if you'd like to propose your own, um, but there's also plenty of things that are, uh, you can just commit to the repo for, for small things. And uh, it's, it's, oh, this slide didn't get, we didn't add the, the logos here. But um, it, it is being used by uh, uh, many companies in production. Uh, the GRPC IO uh, website does list off some of them. Um, we are very concerned with backward compatibility and uh, cross-language compatibility. Because you all saw the list of languages, that means that there's quite a big uh, matrix of, um, uh, things to test, and we do have interop tests between old versions of those languages and uh, across the various languages to make sure that they uh, they all work. Um, and those those do find things occasionally. We're very happy to have them. Uh, there's also things like fuzz testing and things like that for for security. Um, so um, at this point, um, that was sort of the whirlwind tour. Tour. Uh, I'd like to open it up some to, to Q&A of sort of specific things that uh, y'all are interested in. I can go into more detail um, and give y'all an intro. So uh, there's a mic here. If y'all are maybe in the front half of the room, you can probably just raise your hand and I can point at you and repeat the question. So the question is, what is the recommendation for doing load balancing of gRPC? Uh, so gRPC itself comes with uh, a few basic strategies. Uh, so pick first is the default. That is sort of what people expect if you're used to, let's say, HTTP. Um, it's just, there's a bunch of addresses, you know, come across the first one that works and use that for all of your communication. Uh, so that's common across the wide internet. Uh, and it's relatively safe, as in it's not going to have a big explosion of connections, so that's the default. Um, there is round robin, which is the, the, the first, I've got more of the machines, let's just make a connection to each of them. Uh, so round robin is very common. Um, the, it would be very normal to plug in your service discovery mechanism, which we call name resolvers. Um, if that's just DNS, then that's, that's there, um, but there's also plenty of integrations with the various service discovery mechanisms. Uh, and they'll just return multiple addresses, and we will just connect 
to each, um, and that's that's very very common. Um, there are some uh, more advanced uh, strategies, like uh, there was gRPC LB, which is um, right now deprecated in the new things coming. Um, uh, both, and the new thing is is the XDS load balancer. Both of those are meant to be uh, look side load balancers, where the uh, client is told in sort of a partially rich form of how it should connect, what it should connect to. Um, and so then the, there's a centralized load balancer which then makes certain decisions about what uh, the client should do. So that allows doing things like subsetting where you've got 1,000 servers, only connect to 10 or 100 of them, uh, doing geog uh, geographically based uh, decisions and things like that. Um, and then uh, the, the, uh, many of the languages support a uh, plug-in API where you could write your own load balancer. So the question is, is uh, gRPC going to support other types of transports other than just HTTP2? What sort of things do you have in mind? I see, I see. Um, so as mentioned that, uh, that in sort of sidecar environments, um, HTTP2 still has a lot, of, has, has some overheads whenever you're talking to sidecars, and there's mentioned things like uh, Unix domain sockets and things like that. Uh, many of the languages support Unix domain sockets. Um, some of them you get to fiddle with it a little bit. For example, Java has no native support for Unix domain sockets because it's like cross-platform. What, what are Unix domain sockets? Um, but m multiple languages have Unix domain sockets. Um, so it would still be HTTP2 on top of Unix domain sockets, and uh, that tends to work well for people. Um, it, I think other transports, um, depending on how big of a difference it is uh, so that was just sort of a low-level transport difference. Those are pretty easy to add and are generally fine. Um, if it was something more complex, like choosing something other than HTTP2, that we would probably look at. Um, HTTP2 is very useful because uh, it provides a lot of benefit and it's, um, uh, all the languages support it, so you, you can mix and match pretty There's easily. No plugging for transport. Uh, there is not any public API for doing it, for inserting in your own transports. Um, the depending on the language, there's more or less of a transport API, but it tends to be internal because we want to change it over time, and and the performance of a transport can influence. Uh, like we want to change the API in order to to eke out performance, and we we do that do that pretty commonly. Um, but if there's, if there's uh, specifics, again, Unix domain socket in particular should already be a mostly solved problem, um, although depending slightly on which language. Um, but if there's specific, like if someone wanted QUIC, let's just say, you know, QUIC is very similar, uh, has different advantages and, down, and downfalls, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, that, that we would, it would take a much more serious uh, thought, decide whether we want the, to burden the ecosystem with, with that option, because each option sort of adds a cost, but uh, yes, there are, there are ways to plug in additional transports, and some of that has been, been done. Um, and, and for example, like in Java, the in-process transport is uh, just implementing the transport API, um, and it was able to, to completely wipe out, not use HTTP2 at all. Um, and so there's some things there. In-process transport, I guess, is the biggest one that we'd be interested in making a little bit more real. Our socket is another example. Our socket is coming out as the uh, reactive uh, socket. Um, so our socket was brought up. Um, we've, we were a little bit familiar with it. We've not given it, I, I think, serious uh, thought. Um, if, if there's interest, uh, we could look into it. Did you want to say something? OK. C can you talk a little bit more about the interceptors and uh, the reconnect logic? Sure. Um, so um, I think over here on the features, where was it? Uh, oh, those were different slides. Yeah. So, uh, so interceptors um, are pretty much in all languages. Um, they were added to Java first, and they're 
they're made with array. Um, interceptors, the, the idea is to allow you a place where you can insert in your own logic, whatever the heck you want it to be. Um, and so they're, they're commonly known as like middleware in some layers or filters. Uh, those are basically the same as interceptors. Um, the, uh, it, it tends to be um, something that the purpose of interceptors is for times where you, you have some uh, particular behavior and you want to do it across all your RPCs or many different types of RPCs. So for example, auth would be a common one, although we've got other ways of doing auth. Uh, but if you want to do logging, um, um, and some people have implemented caching through interceptors and some things like that. Um, uh, that's that's a high level view. Is is that can I? Is there something more specific? I guess uh, about interceptors I could answer. Okay. Um, so so then the other thing is the reconnect logic. So um, I, it was on the slides. So Y'all could have seen that there that gRPC will automatically reconnect. Uh, whenever you're using gRPC, you you make a channel which has some host name that you're going to connect to, uh, and it's gRPC's job to manage. Connections, however many of them are there are, like if you're doing round robin, it's gonna be lots of them. If it's pick first, there will be a few of them. Um, but it's gRPC's job. And um, at any point in time, the server may want to disconnect, uh, or the network goes down, or you know things happen. Um, gRPC but, will just out of the box reconnect uh, whenever, whenever things get better. Uh, there's exponential back off uh, built in. And so, uh, like, because that's really, really important whenever things are getting disconnected, you don't want to hammer the server then, uh, just hoping it's going to get better. Um, so there's exponential back off to let things recover gracefully. Um, but commonly that won't come into play. Commonly there's a disconnect and we reconnect. And um, you go about your merry way and you never saw it. Uh, streams uh, and RPCs are bound to a particular connection. So if that connection breaks, the RPC will fail. But any new RPCs would be completely fine. Uh, there's no course, guaranteed correspondence between if you do two RPCs that they'll go on the same connection or anything like that. Um, it's just handled by the, the underlying channel. So again, I had a question on uh, load balancing when we use gRPC. So do we have a solution or can you suggest a load balancer that could help me do uh, continuous hashing. Uh, I mean, in order to do continuous hashing, I need to unpack the proto. Uh. Yes, so uh, there's, there's a couple different times that you're wanting to do routing or, or, or get um, a particular request to a particular uh, um, server because uh, there's either sharding going on or things like that. So the common pattern there is uh, either via an interceptor or just in the application code, you put a particular key that's useful. And you can have a couple keys or something like that, but you put a particular key that's useful into the metadata. And so gRPC has, uh, in addition to every request and response, all these messages, there's some metadata, uh, which is basically the HTTP headers. And so whenever, if, the, if you, let's say you're doing proxy-based load balancing, which some people are, the proxy can then see that information and make a routing decision based on it. If they want to do that, that, they can hash maybe that value and then send it to a particular backend. Uh, but the, the client, it's also possible for it to do the, that, that hashing itself. Um, the, th this is the sort of thing that would be available eventually with the XDS load balancer because the XDS protocol allows um, some of that information to be transmitted to tell the client what to do. But um, uh, it's also possible if you're gonna, gonna have a custom scheme or things like that to write your own uh, load balancing plugin that will, that will be able to use that information. Um, sure. Sometimes people will just use an interceptor or something like that as well that, to look at the, the value and then send it to one connection versus another. But we generally prefer it to be within that gRPC channel because that's, a, that's easier for uh, clients to use. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can you talk about the uh, performance trade-offs when you're trying to do like um, streaming with some sort of message broker with like a sidecar proxy with native integration versus like a gRPC bridge? Um, there was quite a bit in that question. Um, 
so, uh, so some trade-offs. Um, streaming is technically a little bit faster than than, than unary request response. Uh, we tend not to. I tend not to want to tell people that too much because then I think they'll go off the deep end and try to use it everywhere because it gets them a little bit marginal uh, performance improvement. Typically, request response is just so much easier to debug and understand what the system is doing. Stats mean something more. Um, uh, but um, a lot of high performance use cases benefit very strongly from streaming. Uh, for example, um, and it, this isn't even, I would say, high performance, but if you're doing uploads and downloads, streaming can be a huge help there because you've got proper pipelining where you can send one thing and then the next and the next, and it's not going to overburden the server. You don't have to figure out what batch size you do, how many concurrent RPCs, or to the same level of how many concurrent RPCs you do. Um, so streaming can be a huge, huge win there. Um, that said, it's going to tend to be uh, a win for your application in some way, as in your application will be able to be more efficient in just how it communicates. Uh, not as much for the wire level wins of, of encoding one way versus the other. Um, let's see, you said uh, a broker, I mean a broker has, uh, it's, it's, it's gonna be a proxy in some way, so it's gonna, I think it would have the, the most obvious uh, performance characteristics. It's gonna have to parse it and translate it. Um, I'm not sure like th that that's just a straightforward trade-off. You get to figure out what other thing are you going to consider other than the broker um, and whether you're getting enough bang for your buck for the broker. Um, I like brokers, um, but you, it's not good for every situation. Uh, yes, yeah, so there's one here. Uh, is there a Postman uh, like tool to view the request and the response, yeah, things like that? Um, so I'm trying to think back. It's been a little while since I looked at Postman. I'm trying to remember exactly where it fits in. Um, there are some tools to fire off your own requests and see the responses. Um, but was it? Did it um, do for live, live on the server and client? Okay, it simulates the client. Okay, okay. Um, so there are a couple different command line tools that will, you can fire uh, RPCs um, just on the command line, giving it the request and then seeing the response. Um, many of them will also use the JSON converter or the uh, text uh, conversion for protos uh, so that you can actually see it as a human being uh, because otherwise it's some gobbledygook binary. Uh, so. Um, uh, there's the gRPC CLI, which we don't have uh, pre-built binaries for, but it, it works. Uh, GRP curl, gRPC curl, uh, there's two of them. Uh, one of them I, I found I really, really liked. I think it was the one without the double C, but um, uh, it, it was in Go, and it was uh, very nice uh, pre-built binaries. Um, and it also does the, the, where you can have a JSON request and you get a JSON response. Granted, it's, it's proto over the wire. Um, and it can do some of the load balancing and things like that too. Uh, you sort of give it a name. Um, yeah. Uh, what time is the talk scheduled to end? Nowish? Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I will be around, others will be around. <laughs>